My first encounter about Kachara was through a friend of mine who runs a world of feng shui shop in Klang. At that time, I was staying in Klang. And I saw some uh, Dharma materials, some Dharma books, and some DVDs. And I was attracted to it, so I bought a book, and I also bought a DVD. And after watching it, and after reading the book, I felt it was so easy to understand about Dharma, because previously, my exposure to Dharma has been the traditional Buddhist textbooks, uh, which was kind of difficult for a layperson to understand. Uh, to understand the meaning of it and to relate it to your everyday life. But in the book and in the DVD, uh, it was explained so simply that you could just, how would I say it, um, you could actually just um, put it into practice, into your daily life. And at that shop, I also had the opportunity to learn about Kachara Soup Kitchen, uh, an organization that is set up to distribute food and uh, medical care to the homeless and to the poor. Um, at that time, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, this sounds so American, because in America, they also have soup kitchens. And those soup kitchens do exactly the same thing. Um, the one difference, I think, is that in America, when they do soup kitchens, people come to a place, and people queue up, and then they get their food, and uh, so on. But in Kachara Soup Kitchen, um, the practice is a bit different in the sense that people gather, the members gather, the volunteers gather, they pack the food um, and then they go on the rounds. And I believe that that is a little bit different in the sense that when you do the rounds, you have an exposure, an understanding of how the poor and the homeless live. And when you visit them, you know, just a little smile and it's like, oh, you know, Someone remembers me for today, I, I get food, you know, uh, I have hope, I have something to live on. I think that is the big difference. When you go on the rounds and when you have an opportunity to partici participate, then you realise and then you become a bit more mindful. Like last time when I eat something, I can't finish, I just leave it aside. Now I try not to leave food behind. I mean, whatever that I take out to eat, I try and make sure that I finish it. Because now I become more mindful what it is like for people who don't have food, you know, who don't have drinks and so on. And I think that has helped me a lot. Uh, in terms of compassion and generosity, I believe uh, most people do have an inner generosity, an inner compassion. I mean, if you see somebody sick, you probably will not just walk away. Yeah? You probably will try and help that person. I think every human being has that little bit in themselves. But to be able to develop it uh, further and to be able to actually touch that core for you to go on a long-term practice, I think that needs an exposure to understand what it is like to be on the other side of the fence when I uh, went on the rounds to distribute foods. Um, the first visit I went was to Jalan Pudu. It was raining crazy, you know, I was like, this is the day I choose to do a Kachara soup kitchen round and it rains. Um, and then, and then um, the um, volunteers whom I went with, um, so I asked her a question, I said, do we stop? She says, no, you can't stop because these people are waiting for you, waiting for us to distribute the food, to distribute the, um, the, the, the rounds because they expect to see us and they've been waiting for it and you know, uh, if we don't do it, we're going to disappoint them and they've been looking forward to it so much, you know, our rounds is the one that gives them meaning and gives them hope. And even if it rains, you know, um, if we stop, you know, we're just giving our, our own excuse for not doing the work. And I was like, wow, you know, this is something. So we went on the rounds um, and it rained. It just rained until I think when we were almost complete, then it stopped. Okay. And then I decided to go for the second time and just to try. The second time was to um, Jalantun Sambandan, which is Brickfields. And it was actually bringing along the children for them to have a first exposure. And it was interesting to see um, from the eyes of the children uh, what they feel when they saw, you know, the homeless, um, you know, uh, lying around, you know, with no proper place to sleep you know, looking for food and, you know, eating whatever that is given to them. 
I think that is a very good opportunity that we expose our children because practicing generosity should start when they are young. Children, I think nowadays are too. Some of them are too protected. Some of them have no exposure. They have no me. They have no understanding of what it is to practice generosity. Generosity is probably just sharing a game, sharing a book, but not understanding is what does it mean to a person who is hungry or who is sick and who is looking for someone to help them out. And when I first did the rounds, I also didn't understand. Um, I thought. These people are hungry. Why didn't they go and do something about it for themselves? You know, it's like if I am uh, sick, I would know I have to go and see a doctor. Why don't these homeless people do it? But then I realized is that um, when someone gets into a situation and they don't know how to reach out, and then the depression sets in, they have nowhere else to go. They end up like that because they really, really don't know how to voice, voice it. Some of them are probably too ashamed. Some of them are probably too shy, and they don't know where to go. And I think by us reaching out rather than waiting for them to come to us, is a very, very good、um, practice that we all should learn and should continue to do. I was told about Setrap, a、uh, lot Setrap,、um, quite a few times by my friends who ex first exposed me to, who first talked to me about Kachara House. Um, at that time, when I looked at the picture of Satrap, I was like, "This is not a standard Buddha image. He looks so different," and I didn't understand it. And they said, "Oh, I think you, if you go and、uh, attend the puja and if you、um, follow the prayers, I think that it will help you." And at that time, it it still didn't hit me. Okay, and then I had some personal difficulties. I had a very bad fall. Uh, my husband passed away before that, and I was like, something is not right. My mind was like blocked. I was not happy. I didn't know what I was doing anymore. And then my friend said, "Why don't you think about it?" And I said, "Okay." And I pushed it away. Suddenly, one day in the office, I just decided, "Okay, today is the day I want to go and see what Kachara House is about." And on that day that I chose to come for the Setra Puja, Rinpoche came in to give a Dharma talk. So I was absolutely stunned. It's like one in a million, you know. I walk in and then, you know, I get to listen to a talk live, you know, instead of via the DVD. And Rinpoche talked about a few things.、Um, the relevance of it, one was on death and impermanence, which had a lot of meaning for me because、um, my husband just passed away at that time, not long ago. And the second thing it was, he was talking about obstacles, and、um, talking about how in our own mind、um, we give obstacles to ourselves. Okay,、um, for example, if you want something and you want to really do it, you will go all out and do it. But if you want something, but in your mind you give excuse, then you will never do it. It was something that was so simple. But it was a very effective message. Okay. At the end of the day, at the end of the Dharma talk, on that very day, I decided I will come back and do the Setra Puja. So next, the following week, I came, and from then, I have been doing the Setra Puja ever since. When I first started doing the Puja, I didn't understand the、uh, meaning of some of it.、Um, it was just following the Umze, following the rest to do the practice. And I remembered at that time, someone said, "Have you tried doing sukim offering?" And I said, "What is that?" You say, "You see these people doing sukim offering. They're pouring the black tea and so on." And I was like, "I don't think I can do it because I am still new, and I don't think I will be doing it right." And that person, which is、uh, actually is Professor Choi, she told me, "No, you must try. And if you try, you will be able to do it. It only takes the first step." And I and I realized from then onwards that everything requires a first step. Once you have taken a step, just like a baby learns to walk, you just keep on doing it. You will not look back. So that's how I started on my setra puja, and and that's when I started to understand、um, what a puja does for a person, because at the end of the puja of every session, I realized when I go home, I feel very 
peaceful, I feel happy, and I am able to focus, and I am able to, um, I think, prioritize. It took me quite a while before I understand um, the origin of uh, Lord Satrap, the practice, the symbols behind it. Uh, when the uh, when Kachara Publications came up with a Satrap box, I took it home and I read it. And that book actually explained a lot of things. And now I understand why Satrap is images like that. He is like going to war, you know, he's dressed up like going to war. Um, a wrathful look is like when you want to go to war, you have a fierce look, you have a wrathful look because you want to subdue your enemies. You want to give that wrathful look so that that person is, you know, will take a retreat, you know. Um, so it happens that the wrathful look helps us because it is to help us to uh, subdue our negativities, our obstacles towards practicing Dharma. And him going to war is like cutting down hateful enemies, spirits that may be harming us, um, our own inner attachments, our own distractions like, oh, instead of wanting to practice or go for puja today, I want to go somewhere else, like shopping. So it helps us in our development, looking at the whole picture, the crowns on his head, then we are looking at death and impermanence, because if you don't practice now, when are you going to practice? If not now, when? We will never do it. Because it's like, if you want to do something, and in your mind you come up with a lot of excuses, you will never move forward. To all of us in, the, in, the, in this real world, a horse has speed, um, it, it has momentum. And Lord Satrap sitting on a horse means he can run through all the three realms, he, he, you know, he provides the speed in which we can actually speed up our spiritual development, our spiritual growth. And the human bodies that cuts down is our hateful enemies, our own obscuration, our own distractions, our internal attachments. Um, so it is all very symbolic that if when you um, sincerely pray to Lord Satrap, he will actually help you to remove the obstacles. The symbolism is actually uh, helping us to understand what are the things that we need to look out for in order to speed up our own spiritual development and our own spiritual growth. For me personally, um, the Setra Puja is very important uh, in, the, in, in the week for me because that's the time that I set aside that I know is a time I need to focus. In my daily life, um, there have been cases when I have said that there have been little obstacles and I find that I naturally, I would say, recite Setra Mantra. And it, and the obstacles disappear. It goes off, you know. Um, whether the um, obstacles are real or in my mind, it just goes off. If it is in the mind, it goes off. You are much more focused, and you move on, and you have the confidence to move on. If I have trouble sleeping, I just recite the mantra, and I can sleep very easily. There's no more doubt or fear in me. Um, and it really has helped me a lot. I think now I have found a better peace. My mind is clearer. I have found that there's little more me uh, new meanings in my life. Um, that um, I'm happier with myself. I'm at peace with myself. I can do things on my own. I no longer have to like, for example, oh, I'm alone, I don't know what to do with myself, I need company. I can happily now do things on my own. Uh, there's a lot more peace in me. My friends um, have also said that, yes, you look a lot more peaceful, you also look a lot happier. I think there are two things when you're unhappy. One is, a lot of things are in our minds. We, I, I believe that if your mind is closed, you need to find a way to open up. Because when you open up your mind, is that when the time when you will find peace and happiness. And you will realize that the inner peace and happiness is not your own ego alone. It just doesn't work. If you say, I'm not happy, you will never be happy. Um, in order to be able to take that first step, you must be willing to try. And you must be willing to 
be brave enough to even do a little step to try it. Because if you don't, then no one else can help you. Some people will start to practice um, or go on the spiritual development path when something happens to them. And for that to happen, usually it is not a very good thing that would have happened for you to spur you to do that. So why wait until that moment when something not so good is going to happen and then only you start? Why not start now? The other thing is that I think a lot of us are very em embroiled or involved in uh, material things. Material things are important because we are fortunate, we are born in a world right now, we are all living in a society where we have, you know, access to food, you know, good, uh, you know, clean water and so on. But material things does not bring long-term happiness. How many bags, branded bags can you buy? How many branded clothes can you wear? How many branded shoes can you wear? There's only so much that you can have, but it will not give you that inner peace and that inner happiness. The inner happiness and the inner peace has to come from yourself and from you making that first step.